Your DNA isn't just deciding your eye color and whether you're going bald. It's running silent programs in the background, giving you abilities you've been using your whole life without realizing their genetic advantages. Not everyone got the same build. Evolution handed out different tools to different populations, and some of those tools are still active, still powerful, quietly making you better at specific things than the person sitting next to you. These aren't rare mutations. These are common genetic variants flowing through millions of people who have no idea they're carrying evolutionary upgrades. You might have one. You might have several. And the moment you recognize which ones are yours, a lot of things about how you function suddenly make sense. Let's decode the superpowers hiding in your genes. Superpower 1. The Caffeine Clearance Engine Some people drink coffee at 9 p.m. and sleep like babies. Others sip espresso at 2 p.m. and stare at the ceiling until dawn. That's not willpower or tolerance. That's your CYP1, a two-gene deciding how fast your liver breaks down caffeine. Here's the mechanism. Your liver produces an enzyme called CYP1A2 that metabolizes caffeine. The gene that controls it comes in two main variants, fast and slow. If you inherited the quick version from both parents, you're a rapid metabolizer. Caffeine hits, does its job, and clears your system in two to three hours. You can drink coffee after dinner and still fall asleep on schedule because by bedtime, it's gone. If you got the slow variant, caffeine lingers. The half-life stretches to six, even eight hours. One cup at lunch means you're still feeling it when you're trying to wind down. Your body processes it eventually, just not quickly enough to prevent sleep disruption. The superpower is in the fast metabolism. You get all the focus, alertness, and performance boost from caffeine without the jittery aftermath or sleep penalty. You can dose strategically throughout the day, stay sharp when it matters, and shut down cleanly when it's time to rest. It's pharmacological flexibility that most people don't have. But here's the trade-off. Fast metabolizers also clear caffeine so efficiently that they build tolerance faster. That single shot that used to light you up? In six months, you need a double. Your system adapts, upregulates receptors, and suddenly you're drinking coffee just to feel normal. The same efficiency that prevents side effects also prevents long-lasting benefits. Slow metabolizers, meanwhile, get more mileage per cup. One coffee can carry them half the day. They're more sensitive, which means lower doses, less expense, and less dependency. The downside is that they have to cut off early or pay for it at midnight. About 50% of people are fast metabolizers, concentrated in populations with long histories of coffee or tea consumption. Your ancestors were dosing on caffeine for centuries, and your liver evolved to keep up. If you've ever wondered why your friend drinks cold brew at 4 p.m. without consequences while you're wired from a latte at noon, this is why. It's not discipline. It's genomics. Superpower 2. The Pain Threshold Upgrade It's not just mental toughness or high pain tolerance from experience. It's partially coded in a gene called SCN9A, which controls sodium channels in your nerve cells, the pathways that transmit pain signals from your body to your brain. Specific SCN9. A variance reduce the sensitivity of these channels. They raise the threshold for what your nerves register as painful. A stimulus that sends sharp, urgent signals in most people creates a duller, more manageable sensation in you. You're not ignoring the pain. You're literally feeling less of it at a neurological level. The advantage is obvious. Injuries that sideline others barely slow you down. You recover from workouts faster because muscle soreness doesn't hit as hard dental work, tattoos, physical labor, all more tolerable. In competitive or high-stress environments, this is an endurance edge. Your body's alarm system has a higher activation threshold, so you can push further before it starts screaming. This variant is more common in populations with histories of physically demanding lifestyles, environments where higher pain tolerance meant survival. If your ancestors were endurance hunters, laborers, or lived in extreme climates, there's a decent chance you inherited this. But the mutation cuts both ways. Higher pain tolerance sounds like pure advantage until you remember that pain is a warning system. People with extreme versions of this gene sometimes don't notice injuries until they're serious. A sprained ankle feels like mild discomfort, so they keep walking and turn it into a fracture. Infections go undetected because the pain that should be a red flag barely registers. And there's an emotional component. Studies suggest that people with lower physical pain sensitivity also show reduced emotional pain response. Breakups. Rejection. Loss. The sting is there but blunted. You move on faster. But you might also come across as detached or unaffected when others expect visible grief. The vibe is resilient without realizing it. 
You've been shrugging off things that flatten other people, assuming everyone feels the same way. They don't. You've been operating with built-in shock absorption. If pain has never been your primary obstacle, if you've always recovered faster than expected, this might be your genetic edge. Superpower 3. The Sprinter's Code. The gene that separates the people who explode off the starting line from the people built for the long grind. It controls a protein called alpha-actinin-3, found exclusively in fast-twitch muscle fibers, the ones responsible for speed, power, and explosive strength. Here's how it works. You either produce this protein or you don't. If you have the functional version of ACTN3, your fast-twitch fibers are reinforced, optimized for short bursts of maximum effort. Sprinting, jumping, heavy lifts, rapid direction changes, your muscles are built for it. If you have the non-functional version, your body compensates by developing more slow-twitch fibers, the endurance type. About 80% of elite sprinters and power athletes have at least one copy of the functional gene. It's not the only factor in athletic performance, but it's a significant structural advantage. You're not just training fast-twitch fibers. You're working with more of them, and they're more efficient. The superpower shows up in real life even if you're not an athlete. You're the person who can carry all the groceries in one trip. Who runs upstairs without slowing down? Who has an extra gear when everyone else is gassed? Your nervous system can recruit explosively force on demand because the hardware is there. But the trade-off is endurance. Those same fast-twitch fibers fatigue faster. You can sprint, but you can't sustain it. Marathon runners? They're more likely to have the non-functional variant. Their muscles are built for efficiency over time, not short bursts. You peak early and fade. They warm up slowly and outlast you. There's also an injury risk. Fast-twitch fibers generate more force, placing greater stress on tendons and joints. Explosive athletes tear ACLs, pull hamstrings, and strain connective tissue at higher rates. Your power comes with mechanical vulnerability. Culturally, this gene is more common in West African populations and less common in East Asian populations, which aligns with the regional dominance of sprinting over endurance sports. Genetics doesn't determine destiny, but it influences the starting line. If you've always been quick but never had endurance, if short, intense effort feels natural but long slogs drain you, you're probably running on fast twitch. Superpower 4. The Super Taster Sensitivity. The gene that determines whether you taste bitterness intensely or barely at all. It codes for receptors on your tongue that detect bitter compounds, specifically phenylthiocarbamide, PTC, and propylthiouracil, prop, which are found in cruciferous vegetables, coffee, dark chocolate, and many other plants. If you have the taster variant, those receptors are hypersensitive. Broccoli tastes aggressively bitter. Black coffee is undrinkable without sugar. Dark chocolate has an astringent edge. You're a super taster. And your tongue is picking up flavors most people miss entirely. The evolutionary advantage? Bitter often signals poison. Plants produce bitter compounds as defense mechanisms against being eaten. A sensitive bitter receptor meant your ancestors could detect toxic plants before swallowing, a survival edge in environments where one wrong leaf could kill you. Today, that same sensitivity makes you more discerning. You notice subtle flavors, off notes in food, and the difference between fresh and slightly spoiled. You're harder to please. But when something tastes good to you, it's actually good. Your palate is a quality control system. The downside is nutritional. Super tasters avoid incredibly healthy vegetables, kale, Brussels sprouts, arugula, because the bitterness is overwhelming. You might load up on salt or sugar to mask it, which creates its own health risks. You're also more sensitive to alcohol's bitterness, which can make social drinking unpleasant. About 25% of people are super tasters, 25% are non-tasters, bitter receptors barely function, and 50% are in between. Non-tasters can eat anything without the bitter interference, but they also miss warning signs. Spoiled food tastes fine to them until it's too late. Super tasters also have more taste buds overall, which means texture sensitivity. Creamy, slimy, gritty, you feel it more intensely. This makes you picky, but it also means when you find foods you love, the experience is richer. Suppose you've always been called a picky eater. If vegetables taste like punishment and people don't understand why, you're not difficult. You're genetically wired to taste more and most food isn't designed for your level of sensory input. Superpower 5. The short sleep mutation. A rare genetic mutation that allows some people to function fully on 4-6 to six hours of sleep per night without cognitive decline, health consequences, 
or the need for caffeine. Most humans need 7 to 9 hours. DEC2 carriers genuinely don't. The gene regulates circadian rhythm and how efficiently your brain cycles through sleep stages. The mutation speeds up the process. You hit deep sleep faster, cycle through REM more efficiently, and extract the same restorative value in less time. Your brain is running a compressed, optimized sleep schedule. The superpower is time. If you sleep 5 hours instead of 8, that's an extra 1,095 hours per year, 45 extra days of waking life. Over a lifetime, you're gaining years of productive time while everyone else is unconscious. You're not sleep-deprived. You're sleep-efficient. This mutation is sporadic, present in less than 1% of the population. It's been documented in specific families and has been passed down as a dominant trait. If you have it, one of your parents probably did too. But here's the critical distinction. Most people who think they have this don't. Chronic short sleepers who feel fine are usually running on adrenaline and denial, accumulating sleep debt that will eventually crash their health. True DEC. Two carriers show no cognitive impairment, no increased disease risk, no mood disruption. They're objectively fine on less sleep. The trade-off? There isn't much of one, which is why it's so rare. Evolution doesn't hand out free advantages often. The only documented downside is social. You wake up at 4 a.m., fully rested, while your partner is still deep asleep. Your schedule desynchronizes from everyone else's. You're alert and energized when the world is still offline. If you've always needed less sleep than everyone around you, consistently, since childhood, without crashes or health issues, get genetically tested. You might be one of the rare ones. If you're forcing yourself to sleep less and feeling it, you're not. You're just sleep-deprived. Superpower 6. The Stress Resilience Gene. The serotonin transporter gene that comes in short and long variants, determining how efficiently your brain recycles serotonin after it's released. Serotonin is your mood stabilizer, your emotional buffer, and how quickly you clear it from synapses affects how you handle stress. If you have the long variant, your brain recycles serotonin efficiently. After a stressful event, your neurochemistry resets faster. You bounce back. You don't ruminate as long. Anxiety doesn't spiral as easily. You're not unemotional, just more stable under pressure. People with the long variant show lower rates of depression and anxiety disorders, even when exposed to the same life stressors as short variant carriers. It's not that bad. Things don't happen. It's that your brain processes and releases them faster. You're biochemically equipped for resilience. The advantage is mental endurance. High-pressure jobs, chaotic environments, repeated setbacks. You handle them without breaking. You're the person others lean on in crisis because your nervous system doesn't flood with cortisol and stay there. You reset to baseline. But there's a hidden cost. Because you recover quickly, you might underestimate how stress affects others. You assume everyone rebounds as you do. When they don't, you interpret it as weakness or overthinking. When really, their neurochemistry is working against them. Your resilience can make you less empathetic to people struggling with something you shake off easily. And in extreme cases, the long variant can make you less sensitive to emotional cues, your own and others. You don't dwell, which is excellent for mental health, but can make you seem detached or dismissive in relationships. The short variant, by contrast, makes you more sensitive to both negative and positive experiences. You feel stress more acutely, but you also feel joy, connection, and beauty more deeply. You're more vulnerable, but also more emotionally rich. About 40% of people carry the long variant. If you've always been the calm one, the person who doesn't stay rattled, the one who moves on while others are still processing, this is likely your genetic wiring. Superpower 7. The Dairy Digestion Advantage. Lactase Persistence. The ability to digest milk sugar, lactose, into adulthood. For most of human history, and still for about 65% of the global population, the gene that produces lactase, the enzyme that breaks down lactose, shuts off after weaning. Drinking milk as an adult leads to bloating, cramps, and diarrhea. Lactose intolerance isn't an abnormality. It's the default. But in populations that domesticated dairy animals, cattle, goats, and sheep, a mutation emerged about 10,000 years ago that kept the lactase gene active for life. This happened independently in Northern Europe, East Africa, and parts of the Middle East. If you can drink milk without consequences, you're carrying one of the most recent and successful evolutionary adaptations in human history. The superpower is nutritional access. Milk is calorie-dense, protein-rich, and loaded with calcium and fats. In environments where food was scarce or seasonal, 
Being able to digest dairy meant an additional food source that others couldn't access. It's a built-in survival advantage that's still paying dividends. Today, it means dietary flexibility. You can consume dairy-based protein shakes, yogurt, cheese, and butter without digestive revolt. Your gut produces the enzyme on demand. You're metabolically equipped to extract nutrients from an entire food category. The trade-off? Not many. If anything, lactase persistence can make you complacent about dairy intake, leading to overconsumption of saturated fats or ignoring lactose intolerant friends' dietary needs. And in populations where the mutation is rare, being able to digest milk doesn't help if it's not part of the food system. About 35% of the global population has lactase persistence, but in Northern European descendants, it's 90% plus. If your ancestry traces to Scandinavia, the British Isles, or certain parts of Africa, you almost certainly have it. If you've never understood why lactose intolerance is so common, why people avoid cheese or take pills to eat ice cream, it's because you're running evolutionary software most of the world doesn't have. Superpower 8. The Odorless Gene. ABCC11. The gene that determines your earwax type and, as a bonus, your body odor intensity. It comes in two variants, wet and dry. If you have the dry variant, your earwax is flaky and gray instead of sticky and amber. But the real superpower is what comes with it, significantly reduced body odor. The dry variant reduces the secretion of the compounds in your sweat that bacteria feed on. Bacteria breaking down sweat create body odor. Less of that compound means less fuel for bacteria, which means less smell. You can skip deodorant, and no one notices. You can work out without reeking. Your sweat is mostly water and salt, not the buffet that creates odor. This variant is dominant in East Asian populations, present in 8095% of people of Korean, Japanese, and Chinese descent. In European and African populations, it's rare, under 2%. If you have it and didn't grow up around others who do, you probably thought everyone else just had poor hygiene. They don't. They have different genes. The advantage is social and practical. You don't need daily deodorant. You don't worry about smelling bad in close quarters. You can travel light, rewear clothes, and not broadcast your presence through scent. It's a minor superpower with daily benefits to quality of life. The trade-off is almost non-existent. Wet earwax has no advantage other than being more common in most populations. Dry earwax can be slightly more prone to blockage, but that's rare and manageable. Interestingly, this gene also correlates with a lower risk of breast cancer because the same protein transports specific molecules in breast tissue. So the same mutation that makes you odorless may also offer a slight protective health benefit. If you've always used deodorant out of social habit rather than actual need, if people are shocked when you say you don't wear it, check your earwax. If it's dry and flaky, you've got the gene. You've been playing life on easy mode in the body odor department and didn't even know it. Your genome is not a blueprint. It's a toolkit. And depending on which tools you got, you've been operating with advantages you never named, never connected, never recognized as genetic. These aren't rare superpowers locked behind one in a million odds. These are common variants distributed across populations, silent upgrades running in the background. Maybe you're metabolizing caffeine at warp speed. Maybe your pain threshold is higher than theirs. Perhaps you're built for explosive power, or your taste buds detect poison before it reaches your stomach, or your brain resets from stress while others are still spiraling. Evolution didn't hand out the same build to everyone. It ran experiments. Some populations have lactose persistence. Others got odorless sweat. Some got sprinter muscles. Others got endurance. You're carrying the results of those experiments, and they're still active. So, which genetic superpower do you think you have? Have you always functioned differently in one of these areas and never knew why? Drop a comment with the one that explains something you've experienced your whole life. If you want more deep dives into the hidden biology that's been shaping you since birth, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching. See you at the next one.